Good morning. Welcome to our YouTube mini service. Can't believe this is the first Sunday in October. It really is amazing. I suppose we're already thinking of our Christmas presents. It's a miserable day, as you will have noticed, but we have a number of hardy souls who braved the rain and are smiling through their masks all around the church. And you're welcome any morning, any Sunday morning, that you can make it to our service at 11.30. Now, I have to make a notice uh, for doing the readings. It's quite an important notice. This Tuesday in the church hall at 7.30, we're having our annual general meeting. We'll be observing all the COVID regulations. Uh, as you know, it's usually held around Easter, but we've been delayed because of COVID. And at the meeting, you'll hear a roundup of what's been happening in the church uh, in the last year, and also about the future and to see the financial situation of the church. Don't worry about coming along, you won't be elected into any jobs. Just be relaxed. But it's, um, it's an unusually important meeting because at this meeting we nominate the people who are called parochial nominators. They will be involved in interacting with the bishop as to who comes or who will be getting as leader in this new season of the church. You'll have a chance to vote for the parochial nominators and it's actually very important that we have people who represent the views of the church. So if you can make it this Tuesday, 7.30 in the church hall, our annual general meeting. And now continue with God's word. The first reading is taken from Philippians chapter 3, verses 4b to 14. If someone else thinks they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day, of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law, a Pharisee, as for sin, persecuting the church, as for righteousness, based on the law, faultless. But whatever regains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ, yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained all this, or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have been taken hold of. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead, I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. The second reading is from Matthew chapter 21, verses 33 to 46. It's the parable of the tenants. All parables have deep meanings. This parable, I think, has a very deep meaning. And when you start to listen to it, you'll realize that Jesus is talking about himself. Listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard. He put a wall around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. Then he rented the vineyard to some farmers and moved to another place. When the harvest time approached, he sent his servants to the tenants to collect his fruit. 
The tenants seized the servants, they beat one, killed another, and stole the third. Then he sent other servants to them, more than the first time, and the tenants treated them in the same way. Last of all, he sent his son to them. They will respect my son, he said. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to each other, This is the heir. Come, let's kill him and take his inheritance. So they took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? He will bring those wretches to a wretched end, they replied, and he will rent the vineyard to other tenants who will give him his share of the crop at harvest time. Jesus said to them, Have you ever read in the scriptures, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone? The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you that the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people who will produce its fruit. Anyone who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces. Anyone on whom, on whom it falls will be crushed. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard Jesus' parables, they knew he was talking about them. They looked for a way to arrest him, but they were afraid of the crowd because the people held that he was a prophet. This is the word of the Lord. Reverend Jerry. Thank you so much, Irving. Another warm welcome to you. Thank you for being here this morning, and welcome to you at home. I pray that the blessing of the Lord will be with you now and always. Before we go into the word of this morning, let us bow our heads together to pray to Him. Heavenly Father, we come before you now, as always, in need and dependence, as your children, asking of you that you will prepare our hearts and turn them into good soil to receive what you have to give to us. Come by the power of your Spirit, Lord. Ease our thoughts. Clear us from distractions and help us to hear your voice. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 As everybody was saying, whenever we hear the parables of our Lord, we can perceive immediately, immediately, how his words are alive. As his voice comes to us, there's always present that, that unmistakable seal of truth and wisdom in everything he says and teaches. But there's also his tone. There's something in it that it is so kind and so inviting and so understanding, so compassionate and loving that, that we feel uh, drawn to him. In a safe, though mysteriously safe, uh, and welcome way. So, we can say very much when it comes to the content and to how our hearts are moved by what the Lord says. We can say, as, as they were saying in, in, when he was walking among us, nobody has ever talked like this man. But there's much more uh, that we can perceive in his tone. Like how on occasions his tenderness flowed uh, sweetly and, and happily and freely as, as when he was teaching the parable of the lost sheep or, or the prodigal sons or, or sharing the Beatitudes. Blessed are the poor in spirit, he was saying. And, and, and how on other occasions his tenderness must have been aching 
as when he said the parable we've heard this morning, this one of the tenants. Because our Lord was facing a much more mixed and hostile audience this time. And sadly, when it should have been the opposite, it was in the temple and mainly from the religious authorities that he faced this hostility and opposition. The whole day was one full of tensions, with them trying repeatedly to entrap him while our Lord was bringing the time of his public ministry almost to its closure before going to the cross. And finishes the day crying his heart and lamenting for Jerusalem. Especially for the religious leaders. The parable could hardly not have made them think of themselves and the people of Israel. Since the figures uh, our Lord uses in it are the same found in Isaiah in, in the chapter 5. In the parable we've heard, we have a master of a house who owns a vineyard, fences it, digs a wine press, builds a watchtower, and, and cares for it. In Isaiah, we read to Let me sing for my beloved, my love song concerning his vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He dug it and cleared it of stones and planted it with choice vines. He built a watchtower in the midst of it and hewed out a wine press in it. Those are the first verses in Isaiah chapter 5. And that vineyard is told a few verses later very plainly to be Israel, his people. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah are his pleasant planting. So it must have been very hard for our Lord to share this parable that day, knowing what would happen to them because of their continued rejection. And even what was in store for him was very clearly addressed. Because after the master's servants are repeatedly ignored, killed and stoned, his own son is finally sent, just to be taken out of the vineyard and killed there by the tenants in order to get the vineyard for themselves. There is a sense and a thirst for justice so deeply ingrained within us that when the Lord asks, what will the owner of the vineyard do to those tenants when he comes? They answer with a verdict that he does not deny or disagree with. Even the audience answers like that. He will surely put those miserable wretches to a painful death. And our Lord allows them to come to that conclusion themselves. So they confess the justice that is demanded by this. For it is surely a serious matter to reject with open eyes God's offers of grace. It is a serious matter and one not only with a scary prospect of judgment, but also with a scary present, that of a hardened heart. As we see in the case of the chief priests and Pharisees, who even perceiving the Lord was talking about them, and aware of the wretched evil of, their, of the tenants, Instead of repenting, they went away to behave exactly like them. A hardened heart. 
Now the vineyard was taken away from Israel until their appointed time to be grafted back in comes, because they will be grafted back in. Thank God. It was certainly not out of care and opportunities that this happened to them. Servants, prophets, God's own son were sent to them. But they were also sent for us. And in the words of the beloved, and in the words of the beloved in Isaiah, and now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem, and men of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more was there to do for my vineyard that I had not done in it? But when I looked for it to yield grapes, why did it yield wild grapes? If these words of the beloved make us also think of those of our Lord, that I was referring to. O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those who send those sent to you. How often I have longed to gather your children together, as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you were not willing. The main problem of the tenants was the same problem we face. A heart that refuses to be ruled, that, re that rebels against God's lordship over us. Of the many things that are astonishing in this parable, one of them is, is that grace is still present, nonetheless. Because it's really extraordinary when we, when we think about it in this parable, how the master, who is certainly not a fool, uh, keeps sending his servants and ultimately his son uh, to get his fruit. When after the treatment they received the, the, the first time, uh, he would have demanded a very, very different measures. How many chances are given? And even appealing to the tenants in increasingly more rather than less. He sends more servants. He sends his son. He says, at, at least they will respect my son. At, at least with him they will come to, to their senses. So, so the, the, the chances, the, the grace offered to them is, uh, is, is all the time more rather than less. So therefore, instead of being ready to judge, we need to admit, yes, Lord, what else could you do for your vineyard that you have not done in it? What else? And yet, you know something? He does more. He does more. For, for having sent his son, and with him having been treated and killed as the son in the park, his time of mercy still continues. His time of grace has not ended. He still waits for us and keeps the door open. With what faithfulness? With what tender and patient insistence he tends his arms to us and calls us. With what care he's ready to prune us that we might have his life flowing in us and give fruit. Why should we return his goodness then with white graves? But now briefly before finishing, what, what fruit, what grapes could we give to our Lord that he would delight in them? We go to the book of Isaiah one more time. 
for the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel. And the men of Judah are his pleasant landing. And he looked for justice. But behold, bloodshed. For righteousness. But behold, cries of distress. So, let us bear fruit in keeping with repentance. And, 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 and let us stop all divisions and hatred and difference and coldness that in, instead of, of, of making Christianity beautiful to others, uh, actually they, they make others cringe from it. Let us stop all these things. So let us uh, renounce to, to the evil ways. But, but, but let's do the other half too. That's when uh, many times painful. It depends on how attached we are to, to those uh, sins and, and habits. But then let's turn to the to the other the other half. Let us bear fruits of justice and righteousness, of love and compassion, of all things that that, that our Lord delights in, and and therefore that. Uh, things that do good to others. That's where, where, where faith becomes alive. That uh, when, when Christianity stops being uh, religion, uh, that life flowing from us and flowing to others and affecting others. Let us walk in a way in which it be clearly seen that we have turned to the let us bear fruit, right? When he comes, like, I planted my vineyard. He, 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 he cares for the vineyard in your heart. He does everything that needs to be done. He waters with his spirit. He gives the life of his soul. He, he prunes. He, he works with us. Walk with us. But let's, let's return the, the fruit that, that that he works in us. And so, let us pray. Heavenly Father, what else could we demand that you have not done what else could we expect that we have not received from your hand? Faithfulness, mercy, a mercy that is new every morning, a love that, and peace that passes our understanding. Your soul, your word, your spirit, your promises, yourself walking with us and being with us until the end of the world. Help us first not to resist your lordship over us and please take the reins of our lives. Make us willing to be gathered under your wings and once there, Keep us with you and give us your life and more and more of your spirit that we might become fruitful and bear good fruits for your joy and the joy of others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Friends, don't.